الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى today I want to speak about a topic that I think all of you will be able to relate to إن شاء الله تعالى and that is the concept of uh, apathy, al-futur, laziness when it comes to ibadah. What are the things that causes it? And how can we treat it? So apathy, it causes signs and treatments, inshallah ta'ala. Futur, it means when your interest for something reduces. And your enthusiasm for it also reduces. And your concern for it becomes weary. Something that we all go through. That we're sometimes strong, we're up to the standard, and sometimes that zeal that we have weakens. How can we cure it? And what are the things that are making it happen? Our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith al-Imam Ahmad narrated in his musnad min hadith Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said inna li kulli amalin shirah wa li kulli shiratin fatratun fa man kanat fatratuhu ila sunnati faqad aflaha and another word in faqad hudiya wa man kanat ila ghayri thalika faqad halak the Prophet said, Indeed, for every action there is a zeal, enthusiasm, energy. And for every zeal there is a slackening, a, person, a time, a period where the person slacks and they go down and they dip. And, and they are not as enthusiastic and energetic as they are on other days or the, the way that they've been before. Then the Prophet said, فَمَنْ كَانَتْ فَتَرَتُهُ إِلَى سُنَّتِي Anyone who is slackening, and anyone who is, his apathy occurs, but he's still in, in line with the sunnah, فَقَدْ أَفْلَحَ He's successful. As long as he hasn't reached a point where he goes away from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then he's still successful. وَمَنْ كَانَتْ إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ ذَلِكَ And anyone who is slacking, his slackening goes down and deep beyond and outside the sunnah, فَقَدْ هَلَكَ He becomes destroyed. So what we take from the hadith is, every single one of us is going to go through, in any action that we do, that period, that fatrah, that slackening moment where the energy is gone, we have to drag our leg. We have to um, kind of convince ourselves to have to do this. What is it that causes that to happen? And is there any way that we can overcome that and treat it? Is this something that you all feel that is sometimes happens in your life? So inshallah ta'ala, let's talk about what makes it happen. al Imamu. Ahmed and Bukhari and Muslim and others narrated on the authority of Nu'man ibn Bashir that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us about an organ. The Prophet said, Ala wa inna fil jasadi mudgha. Verily, inside the human body, there is an organ. Ida salahat, salah al jasadu kullu. If this organ is upright and steadfast, the entirety of the body is in line with that with that organ. Your body will follow that organ. If that organ is good, then the body will be good. And if that organ is corrupt and it's misguided, then the entire body will follow it. And the Prophet said in that hadith, Ala wa hiya al-qalb. That organ is the heart. So, from this point, I'm trying to sh sh shed some light and also explain to you that slacking 
is something that comes from the heart. It's this organ that brings about the energy, the enthusiasm, the concern, the commitment, and the interest. And it's when this organ becomes weakened and this organ becomes corrupt, the body then follows and becomes corrupt with it and slacks. And the scholars, they categorize the heart into three. The scholars, they categorized the heart into three. The first heart is Qalb which is Salim, an upright heart, a steadfast heart. A heart that accomplished three things. Qalb which is Salim is a heart that has accomplished and accumulated three important components. The first one is it comes with sincerity, ikhlas. It's a sincere heart. The second thing that heart has achieved and attained is it's in line with the Prophet It follows the Prophet Externally and internally. And number three, this person comes with obedience, ta'a, which is to stay away from sins. And stay away from the two types of sins, major or minor sins. Those are the three things. A qalb which is salim, an upright heart, an untainted heart, is a heart which has attained and achieved sincerity and also adherence to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and three, complete and utter submission to Allah azza wa jalla. Those are the three. And it's the heart where Allah wa ta'ala told us it will benefit us the day of judgment. Allah said in the ayah, speaking about Nabi Allah Ibrahim, وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ Oh Allah, do not humiliate me the day of resurrection. What day is that? يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ it is the day when children and wealth are not going to benefit you. The money that you're accumulating now, the money that you are trying to achieve and gain, the money that you are burning your body and mind for, it won't benefit you that day. And children are not going to benefit you unless you come to Allah with what? بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Qalb which is Salim. The Qalb which is Salim, I said it's a what? It's a heart that has sincerity. It's a heart which is in accordance to the Prophet Sallallahu way. And three, it's a heart that has come with or achieved complete submission to Allah Azza wa Jalla. The second heart is Qalb which is Mayyit, a dead heart. The dead heart is a heart that has no life in it. It's a qalb which is dead. It has no life in it. Allah said in the Quran, One who was dead and we gave him life. Meaning referring to the disbelievers. They were dead, meaning their hearts were dead. And Allah wa ta'ala says, we gave them life. Meaning their qalb is dead. Because they're not dead, we can see them walking. But their hearts have died. The sec third one is qalb which is marib. A qalb which is sick. When you're sick, that doesn't mean you're completely unhealthy. There are, you might have healths in other things, but your illness also may be in something else. So there is health and there's illness as well. This is the heart of the Muslim who sins and has that weakness of Iman, and he also has the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla and his messenger. So he goes to the masjid, and he prays in the jama'ah, and he also goes out clubbing and doing haram things, and drinking that which Allah prohibited, and eating that which Allah prohibited. So he's sometimes doing good, and sometimes he's transgressing, he's exceeding his limits, and going against his Lord Allah Azza wa Jalla. The heart that we're going to be talking about, the qalb which is, that goes through futur, that goes through empathy, that has that slackening, 
it is the heart which is what? Marid. Because the one that's mayit is dead. It needs to be switched on in the first place. Okay? And the qalb which is salim, it's upright, steadfast. The qalb which has futur is the one which is marid. It has a sickness in it. The Prophet ﷺ told us in another hadith that supports the ayah يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ The Prophet told us in the hadith, Imam Muslim narrated in the hadith Abi Huraira, the Prophet said, يَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةِ A group of people will enter Jannah. A group of people will enter Jannah. What are their characteristics? أَفْئِدَتُهُمْ مِثْلَ أَفْئِدَةِ الطَّيْرِ Whose hearts would be the likes, or their, their heart would be like the heart of birds. Pure untainted they don't suffer from sickness and illness in the heart they have pure cleansed clean hearts those are the people are going to who are going to enter jannah the prophet said yadkhulul jannah a group of people will enter jannah yadkhulul jannah aqwamun afidatu mithlu afidati mithlu afidati at-tayri their hearts are the hearts of birds now the question is what are the main things that the heart suffers from? The heart suffers from many illnesses. But they are two main illnesses. The first one is shahawat. Desires. And remember the chain of discussion that we're having and the way that the lecture is going. We are talking about how can you have zeal in ibadah. How can you have that energy and that concern and that enthusiasm in ibadah? In obedience of Allah, I said it's because of the heart. It's the way that you treat your heart and the health of your heart which brings about this enthusiasm or brings about this lack of enthusiasm and lack of interest and lack of concern. So now we're dealing with the heart. If you cure this heart, energy and enthusiasm will come. I mean... We are living at a time when people are really focusing on their physical appearance. What I mean by that is, they watch and they look at what is it that I'm going to use for my hair so I don't have hair loss. What kind of oil am I going to use? What kind of cream am I going to use that doesn't bring out wrinkles at an early age in my life? What kind of food am I going to eat in order to be in good shape and healthy? People are looking at that appearance. But the heart is dying and it's rotting. And we've seen people whose appearance, when you look at them, they look so healthy. And they look very amazing and charming. And... But when you see their relationship with Allah, Azza wa Jalla, you find that they're the lowest and weak you see a person who's physically physically in shape the kind of things that he does he, the marathons he can run the time he spends in the gym the weights that he lifts that the same individual is unable to get up for fajr because he can't lift something very light and that's the duvet and get out of bed and go and pour water on himself and do wudu and go and pray the fajr prayer He's got the physical ability. He's not a weak person. Why is it he can't do it? And you find a person who's skinny, weak person, does, looks fragile, the wind can blow him, and he's getting up for Fajr. He's standing at Qiyamul Layl. He's out and about helping the people. He's helping the Masaikeen. The hours that person can stand and the energy that person has, you can never come with it. How? How does that come about? Something deep now. It's something to do with the heart. It's someone who's trying to work on their heart and trying to cleanse it and clean it. So the first thing that the heart suffers from is shahawat, desires. What does it suffer from? Shahawat, desires. Abdullah ibn Abbas said something very powerful and I want you to all listen to this. Abdullah ibn Abbas he said, Inna lil hasanati dhiyaun. Righteous actions, it has light. 
fil wajhi on a person's face. Allah makes that person's face glow. This person's face illuminates. وَنُورًا فِي الْقَلْبِ And that person's heart, light gushes from it. وَسِعَةً فِي الْرِزْقِ And Allah opens your provision for you. Your provision, your rizq. Allah makes it wide for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقُوَّةً فِي الْبَدَنِ And Allah gives you physical strength. Look at that. The photo, right? Righteous actions. Bring about enthusiasm and strength in the body. وَمَحَبَّةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ And Allah places in the hearts of the people love towards you. Ibn Abbas goes on to say, in رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْهُ وَإِنَّ لِسَّيِّئَةِ The opposite, which is evil doing, going against Allah's commandments, disobeying رَبُّ الْأَرْضِ وَالسَّمَاءِ It has what? سَوَادًا فِي الْوَجْهِ Blackening of one's face. وَظُلْمَةً فِي الْقَلْبِ And darkness in the heart. وَالْقَبْرِ And also darkness in your grave. وَوَهَنًا فِي الْبَدَنِ And weakness and fatigue on one's physical strength and ability. وَنَقْصًا فِي الْرِزْقِ And Allah reducing your wealth and your income. وَبُغْضَةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ And the hearts of the people the people have enmity and hate towards you. All of this is what? It's all based on a person following his desires. If you follow your desires, shahawat, whatever your nafs calls you to, it brings about what? Sawadan fil wajhi, blackened face, wabulmatan fil qalbi, darkened heart, wal qabri, and a darkened grave, wawahanan fil badani. And also a physical weakness. وَنَقْصًا فِي الرِّزْقِ And a reduction in your provision. وَبُغْضَةً فِي قُلُوبِ الْخَلْقِ And enmity and hate in the hearts of the people for you. People don't want to see you. They hate your guts. All of this is because you following your desires. Then, if you follow your desires and you submit to it and you adhere to it, it will lead to you becoming physically weak. And Imam Al-Tirmidhi narrated, and I want you to listen to this hadith as well, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, Inna al-abda the slave, Ida akhta'a khati'atan, the slave does a sin. Nukitat fi qalbihi, nuktatun sawda. The person commits a sin. A black dot will be placed on his heart. You follow your desires, a black dot is placed on your heart. Fa'idha huwa naza'a wa staghfara wa taaba suqila qalbuh. But if the person... He repents. He comes back to his senses. He asks Allah for forgiveness. His heart is then cleansed and cleaned. And if he goes back to the sin again, the black dots are increased in his heart. Until it overcomes his heart and his heart becomes darkened and black. The Prophet said, and it's the ran, الذي ذكر الله, which Allah mentioned in the ayah, كلا بل ران على قلوبهم ما كانوا يكسبون. The ran Allah is referring to here is the darkened heart. Dots, 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 black, black dots, and his heart became all black now. And you know what that person becomes because of what's happening to his heart. لا يعرف معروفا ولا ينكر منكرا. He can never identify the good. He can never see the good when it comes to him. And he can never really see the evil. He becomes a cup which is upside down and a person is trying to pour water into it. An upside down cup. That water is trying to be poured into it. That's what your heart becomes. All the good that has been mentioned and all of the khair which has been said to you will all go over your head. It just doesn't seem to make sense. It all seems like a hocus pocus. Jannah and Naar and all of this. And you don't even sense that what you're in is severe and dangerous because the heart has become darkened and dull. And we have to now, if we've fallen into these sins and we've followed our desires, the way to cleanse our heart again and bring it to its default position 
is to what? It is to repent and to ask Allah for forgiveness, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar radiallahu anhu said, Hasibu anfusakum. Account yourselves. Put yourself on accountability. Qabla antu hasabu. Before you are accounted for the day of judgment. Wazinu anfusakum. And scale yourselves. Qabla antu zanu. Before you are scaled the day, the day of judgment. فَإِنَّهُ أَهْوَنُ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الْحِسَابِ غَدًا It is easier for you to scale yourself and to account yourself now today. It is easier for you than the Day of Judgment. وَتَزَيَّنُوا أَنْ أَدُونْ يَوْسَوْفْ أَدُونْ يَوْسَوْفْ Meaning beautify yourselves. لِلْعَرْضِ الْأَكْبَرِ The great day. The day where every single person Allah is going to present to them their reality. وَتَزَيَّنُوا لِلْعَرْضِ الْأَكْبَرِ that day everybody it will be shown to them their reality and what they are everything you've done so the first thing that the heart suffers from is what desires desires is the first thing that the heart suffers from and it's an illness that the heart really suffers from and if we don't wake up and we don't stop it going into our hearts our hearts become dark, dull, black, and we will never realize the good that we should go towards. And we won't realize the evil that we're in. And our bodies become weak, and we won't be able to run to the obedience of our Lord, Allah Azza wa The second is ash-shubuhat, doubts. The first one was desires, and the second one is doubts. The doubt is worse than the desires. And the doubt is innovation and disbelief. Those two are called shubuhat, bida and kufr. Both of them, if they steep into a person's heart, then it destroys the heart worse than the desires. Imam Malik, look what he said to a man. Imam Malik, atahu rajulun, a man came to Imam Malik. فَقَالَ هِي سَرْيَا أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ أَبَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ مِنْ أَيْنَ أُحْرِمُ الإمام أبي عبد الله أحمد الإمام الإمام أبي عبد الله مالك بن أنس الإمام مالك he was called إمام دار الهجرة الإمام مالك and he was the scholar and the imam of the people of مدينة are we all together الإمام مالك was a noble imam who when he would narrate the hadiths of the prophet because he would be right next to the Prophet's grave, he would say, يَقُولُ صَاحِبُ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ The man of this grave said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, and he would tell the narration. Whereas we would say, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Right? He is right next to the grave. So he would say, the man of this grave said, are we all together? Al-Imam Malik. A great Imam. شَهِدَ لَهُ الْأُمَّةِ The Ummah unanimously agreed upon his station and his nobility. رضي الله a man came to him and he said, I want to go hajj. I want to go hajj. And when I go hajj, I want to do my ihram. I want to wear my clothing for hajj. Where should I wear it from? Min aina uhrimu. And we all know, or we should all know, that the people of Medina, the place that they wear their ihram from for hajj is Dil Hulayfa. Dil Hulayfa is the place that they wear it from. So the man came and he said to Imam Malik, Min aina uhrim? Where shall I wear my ihram from? And then Imam Malik said to him, Min dil hulayfa. Go to dil hulayfa and wear your ihram from there. And do your intention from there. And Imam Malik went on to say, Min haythu ahrama Rasulullah. The place where the Prophet did it from. The place where the Prophet ﷺ did his ihram from, which was dil hulayfa, go to that place and you do it from there, okay? The man then said, Inu uridu an uhriba min al masjidi min indi al qabri. The man said, As for me, I want to wear my ihram from the Prophet's masjid next to his grave. That's where I want to do it from. I don't want to go to Dil Hulayfa. I want to go to the Prophet's masjid and next to the Prophet's grave, I want to do it. Keeping in mind, this man is, he wants to do a extra deed because doing it from the prophet's masjid and wearing it from the prophet's masjid next to the prophet's <coughs> grave is more distance than to wear it from dil hulayfa 
Because if he went to Dhul Hulayfa the way he is, he could enjoy himself until he comes to Dhul Hulayfa. And then after that, he would have to wear his haram, right? So he's making it harder on himself. So Imam Malik ala kulli hal said to him, La taf'al. Don't do that. Fa'inni akhsha alayka al fitna. Fa'inni akhsha. Imam Malik said, I fear for you fitna. Trial and tribulation. That's what I fear for you. The man was gobsmacked, lost of words, mind boggled. He said, Which fitna are you possibly talking about? This is only a couple of what? Miles that I'm going to increase. What fitna can you possibly fear for me? And then Imam Malik said a golden statement. Imam Mujadid Hizra. He said, What fitna is worse than? من أن ترى أنك سبقت إلى فضيلة قصر عنها رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. What fitna is greater? What other fitna are you waiting for than to see? What other fitna could there possibly be greater than seeing yourself to go forward in a righteous deed and try to surpass Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم to precede the Prophet in a righteous actions. To get there before the Prophet, to be higher than the Prophet in a righteous actions that the Prophet was deficient in. That's according to your actions, that's what you're saying. I'm, I'm doing better than what the Prophet is doing. What fitness worse than that? And then he recited to him and he said, Inni sami'tu, I heard Allah Azza wa Jalla say, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَلِيمٌ Let them be cautious. Who? Those who oppose the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his affairs. What's going to happen to them? And to see bahum fitna, that they will be afflicted with a calamity, a trial and a tribulation. Or you see bahum, or they are afflicted with what? A severe punishment. A punishment which their bodies and minds will not be able to endure. So this hadith, this statement of Imam Malik shows us the severity of innovation. And the severity of following ones, or following doubts. This is shubuhat. Shubha. And Imam Malik was trying to get this man to understand this is a fitna for your heart that you would follow such and such. Walidharika, the early scholars, the early Imams, they realized the severity of innovation and how it can affect the hearts. Walidharika, Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah, he said, La tujali sahib bid'atin. فَإِنَّهُ يُمْرِضُ قَلْبَكِ Hassan al-Basri said, don't sit with an innovator. Don't sit with him. فَإِنَّهُ يُمْرِضُ قَلْبَكَ Because he will taint your heart. He will make your heart sick. فَإِنَّهُ يُمْرِضُ يُمْرِضُ means what? He'll make your heart قَلْبٌ مَرِيضٌ A sick heart. I ask you guys a question. If sitting with an innovator makes your heart sick, then what about the heart of the innovator? If your heart is going to become sick from sitting with him, then what about his heart who contains in it and he holds the innovation? What is his situation? It's even worse. Ibn Aunin said, I had Muhammad ibn Sirin, the great Tabi'i, Muhammad ibn Sirin. I heard him say, or I saw that Muhammad ibn Sirin mentioned and used to believe, Yara anna asra an nasi riddatan ahl al ahwa. The people who were the fastest in apostasy were the people of desires, people of, de- people of innovation. They are the fastest when it comes to apostating and leaving the religion. Because innovation doesn't stop there, it leads to kufr. It's a stepping stone to disbelief. A person just leaves the fold of Islam. Muhammad ibn Sirin, he saw. أَسْرَعُ النَّاسِ رِدَّةً The people who are the fastest in apostating, the quickest to apostate and leave the religion are who? أَهْلُ الْأَهْوَى The people of innovation. They apostate easily. Why? Why do they apostate easily? Because disobeying Allah in one step has no limit. If you've disobeyed Allah in one thing and you've then said this is the way Allah loves, 
That's what innovation is. Going against Allah's way and the Messenger's way and then saying this is what Allah is pleased with and this is what Allah loves and this is what's going to get me close to Jannah. It doesn't stop there. It will carry on until the whole entire religion becomes like that for you. So those are the two things that the heart suffers from my beloved brothers and sisters. Shahawat and Shubuhat. Today we find people who listen to people of innovation. They will listen to their lectures. They will listen to things that they say. And then they will come and say, Sheikh, I came across this person saying this and this and this thing. What's the response? Ya Akhi, why are you opening your ears to the people of innovation? Why are you listening to someone who is bringing doubt in the religion? Why would you open your eyes and your mind to it? Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And great a'imma. Whenever they went by innovators and they spoke to them, they took their fingers and they put it in their ears and they walk away. Are you more knowledgeable than Al-Imam Muhammad? A man came to Al-Imam Malik, an innovator, came to Al-Imam Malik and he said, I want to debate with you. The Al-Imam Malik said to him, if I beat you in the debates, will you follow me? He said, yes. He said, if you beat me, what do you want? He said, you follow me. He said, if a third person comes and beats both of us, what do we do in that situation? He said, we both have to follow him. He said, I see that you are not consistent upon your path and your way. You are doubtful of what your religion is. I am clarity. I'm upon clarity in my religion and you seem like a skeptical person. You're not, you're not sure about your religion. Go to someone who's doubtful like you and go and debate them. Go to someone who is skeptical like you and debate with him. I don't need that. Are we all together? Al-Imam Ahmed Ibn Du'ad, when he tried to debate Imam Muhammad in the, front, in the presence of the leader, Ahmed said, I don't want to debate you. On the issue of, the, is the Qur'an created or not? Jabalu, a sham, a staunch mountain, Ahmed said, I don't want to debate you. Because the Salaf, they believed what they are upon is haq, la miryata fi. They weren't doubtful about that. So why do I have to open my religion, urdatan lil niqash? Why do I have to open my religion for discussion? Whether it's right or wrong. Why do I need to open that for it? Are we all together? And that's what Allah said in the ayah. بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِالْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ They disbelieved in the truth when it came to them. So what happened to them? بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِالْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ فَهُمْ فِي أَمْرٍ مريج. They are in doubt of everything. They disbelieved in the textual evidence. They said, ah, this hadith doesn't make no logical sense. I can't rationalize it. My mind doesn't accept it. So when they did that and they rejected the Quran and the Sunnah on that premise, Allah says, فَهُمْ فِي أَمْرٍ مريج. Everything about their religion becomes doubts. And that's what happens. Now I want to mention, inshaAllah ta'ala, the cure. I mentioned this illness that the people whose hearts uh, suffer, the two illnesses that they suffer from, shubuhat and shawat. Now I want to mention some cures that inshallah ta'ala will cure your heart and if you take these steps it will help you. Al-Imam Abu Zakariya Yahya ibn Mu'adh ibn Ja'far al-Razi He is Imam, a great Imam. Jaba'a bayn al-ilmi wal-amal. This Imam combined between knowledge and action. An Imam who combined between action and knowledge. He said, Dawa'u al-qalbi khamsatu ashya. If you have not written anything from this lecture, write this, inshaAllah ta'ala. Write these points, even if it has to be in your phone. Dawa'u al-qalbi khamsatu ashya. The cure of the heart, he said, are five things. The cures and the treatment for one's heart, he said, is five things. I encourage every one of you to take these five, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to mention, stick it in your house and make it your life mission, inshallah ta'ala, to every single day work towards having all of these five present in your day. I promise you, once you do, you will see enthusiasm, commitment, constituousness towards any action that you stand up for. Laziness will go. He says that the cure of the heart are five. The first one he said, قِرَاءَةُ الْقُرْآنِ بِالتَّفَكُّرِ Reading the Qur'an and pondering and contemplating over it. Pondering over the Qur'an and contemplating over it. 
what's the bare minimum that a person used, used to finish the Qur'an? Even if you're not a hafiz. And you've not memorized the Qur'an. What is the bare minimum that you should read from the Qur'an? Ishaq ibn Rahuya, the man who said to Imam al-Bukhari, you all know Imam al-Bukhari, right? You all know Imam al-Bukhari, right? Yeah? Is there anyone who doesn't know Imam al-Bukhari? Ha. Imam al-Bukhari, you remember he wrote a Sahih book, right? That's why we say Sahih al-Bukhari, right? Who was the one who brought the idea to Imam al-Bukhari to write the Sahih? Who encouraged him? Who did it? Ishaq ibn Rahuya. Ishaq is the teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. He said that a person needs to finish the Qur'an whether reading from the Mus'haf or whether reading from memory at least, and this is something for every Muslim, every 40 days once, you need to finish the Qur'an, he said. Every 40 days that goes by, you have to have done one khat. That's the bare minimum. And the evidence that he used for that is what the Prophet said to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Remember when Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, his father complained about him. Amr ibn al-As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, his father complained about him. Amr ibn al-As. He said to the Prophet, My son Abdullah, I married him off to one of the greatest families of Quraysh. I married their daughter off to my son Abdullah. He's married to an honorable woman from an honorable household. And he... Spends the whole entire night praying and the whole entire day fasting and he forsakes the rights of his wife. And then the Prophet وسلم, said to Abdullah ibn, Amr, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, is this true? Do you do this? And he said, of course, O Messenger of Allah, I do do that. Then the Prophet said to him, fi Read the Quran in every 40 days. Finish it once. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As was finishing it every day. He said to him, finish it every 40 days once. So thus, Ishaq said, every 40 days, once you have to finish the Quran. If you're a hafid, a person who's done hifd, then it's highly recommended for you, it's highly recommended that you finish every three days. If you're a hafid. So what do you do? You start from Surah Al-Baqarah, and you read and you go up to that's the first day. The second day you take from وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ مَا غَنِمْتُمْ سُورَةُ الْأَنْفَالِ And you take it to Surah Al-Naml فَمَا كَانَ جَوَابَ قَوْمِهِ That's the second ten. And the third ten, you take it from كَانَ جَوَابَ قَوْمِهِ up to Surah Al-Nas. خلاص. Every three days you finish the Quran. Ten, ten, ten juz. That's the ten juz that you read every day. If you're a hafid and you finish the Quran. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finally said to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As when he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I can read the Quran and I can finish it in less than 40 days. 40 days is too much. And the Prophet pushed it down and down and down until what? Every three days finish it once. So the every three days finish it once is for the half of who memorized the Quran every three days. And I know a brother who read, he, he, he never studied with a Quran teacher. But he could read from the Mus'haf. For 10 years, he said to me, I finished the Quran every three days. And he said, this is where I, my hifd became, I became a hafid. And he doesn't do mistakes. I would say if you do it for five years, and you, you finish the Quran every three days, from the Mus'haf, from the Mus'haf, for five years you do that, you will be a hafid. That repetition, you'll memorize it. Wuhayb ibn al-Ward Wuhayb ibn al-Ward is the student of Ata ibn Abi Rabah and Ata ibn Abi Rabah is the student of Abdullah ibn Abbas Wuhayb ibn al-Ward said something very powerful he said lam najid shay'an araqqa li hadhihi al-qulub wa la ashad istijlaban lil haqq min qira'ati al-Qur'an li man tadabbara Wuhayb ibn al-Ward said something very powerful he said we have not found anything that can soften the heart and that can bring your heart to, to the truth than reciting the Qur'an and contemplating and pondering over it. Wahib ibn Ward, rahimahullah ta'ala. The second thing that is 
Qiyamul Layl. The second thing that the great Imam mentioned from the five is what? Qiyamul Layl. Qiyamul Layl softens the heart. And when Allah prays the believers, what did He say about them? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, sorry, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith, Al Imam Al Tirmidhi narrated in his Sunan, Min hadith Abi Umamat Al Bahiri, Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Alaykum bi Qiyamil Layl. Upon you is Qiyamul Layl. Pray Qiyamul Layl. Fainahu da'bu salihina qablakum. Because Qiyamul Layl is the action of the early pious Imams. This is what they did. The Sahabas were like this. The prophets were like this. They used to pray Qiyamul Layl. It will bring you close to your Lord. And it's also a expiation for your sins. And it's a preventative factor from one falling into sins. One of my teachers one time in a halaqa, one of the students said, Shaykh, Wallah, I struggle to pray Qiyamul Layl. It's hard for me to pray Qiyamul Layl. I really want to pray, but I feel that I'm not a- I'm able to. I always try, but I'm not able to get up and pray. I don't, have the, I don't get the energy. And he said, a statement, I never forget it. He said that Qiyamul Layl is an invitation from Allah to those who were upright in the daytime. The, qiyamul, the night prayer is a reflection of your day. Allah only invites you only to Qiyamul Layl. This is an honor. Not everyone gets it. You're invited to pray Qiyamul Layl when you are upright and steadfast the whole entire day. If you were eating haram, you're making haram income, and etc., and you are cheating and lying and deceiving, and you're fouling your speech, and you have hasid and hiqd and Ill- illness towards the Muslims, and you're always falling into wrongdoings the whole entire day, you're not going to be honored to pray Qiyamul Layl at night. Allah won't give you that honor. Because why? Allah comes down the last third of the night, and He's taking the forgiveness and the supplication of those who are invoking onto Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not going to be honored with that. You're not going to be honored. That's very powerful. Qiyamul Layl is an invitation from Allah. And it comes from how you are the daytime. Al-Imam Al-Tabarani mentioned something very powerful. I love this hadith when I read it. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is the one who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, يَضْحَكُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ Allah laughs. Allahu Azza wa Jalla laughs. إِلَىٰ رَجُلَيْنِ two men. Allahu Azza wa Jalla. And this dhahik, great imams they mention is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is laughing because he's pleased with this person. He loves this person. The first one is the one that concerns us now. A man who stood up in the middle of the night. And his family are sleeping. And he got up out of his bed. And he done wudu. He did tahara and purified himself. And he then prayed. فَيَضْحَكُ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ Allah laughs at that person. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with that person. Allah is pleased with subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third thing that the Imam mentioned, rahimahullah, from the five is مُجَالَسَةِ الصَّالِحِينَ Sitting with the righteous people. Ya ikhwa, sitting with the righteous people will cleanse your heart. A person takes from the person that they're with. We all know, brothers, that we are human beings. We need to socialize. We need to have friends. When you look at the Quran and the Sunnah, it doesn't ever tell us not to have friends. Allah doesn't ever say don't have friends. And the Prophet never said that. Because it goes against our nature. We have to have it. We have to coexist. But Allah Azza wa Jalla told us, and His Prophet, Nabiullah Muhammad, is there, does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi need anyone's help? He's got Allah Azza wa Jalla, right? Ba'adhalika Allah told him to be around the righteous people. Nabiullah Muhammad. 
الله سيد واصبر نفسك مع الذين يدعون ربهم بالغداة والعشي يريدون وجهه محمد be patient with the righteous people be with them be patient with them stay with them if that is said to Nabi Allah Muhammad what about you you don't have revelation backing you up and helping you your iman is not as strong as the Prophet to defend yourself if something is evil is being brought to you so you watch who you be with the poet he said لا تسأل عنه don't ask about this person واسأل عن قرينه فإن القرين بالمقارن يقتدي don't ever ask about a person but ask about who he associates with because everyone takes a friend the one he loves you don't ever find a pigeon flying with an eagle do you find that? a pigeon and an eagle flying together and going together pigeons fly with pigeons eagles fly, fly with eagles falcons fly with falcons and what am I like that? you'll never see a lion chilling with a dog yeah? would you ever see that? they don't you sitting with this person means there is something in this person that you and him have in common it's a reflection of who you are are we all together? that's why the Prophet said المرء على دين خليله the person is of the religion of his friend فَلْيَنْظُرَ أَحَادَكُمْ مَنْ يُخَالِلُهُ look at who you take a friend we know we've seen a lot of people who have fallen into what they fell into not because of their own mere action is because of the influence of someone evil someone evil influenced them and they did it there are some people in prison not because of their mere action alone I mean, of course it's their actions but it's not just their actions it was the motivation it was the encouragement of a corrupt individual so one of the things that destroy a person's heart is what i'm me myself if i go to a halaqa where i'm listening to a shaykh who's mutawadi simple zahid aesthetic boycotted this dunya and his heart is towards the akhirah your iman increases and your actions become stronger and if you sit with a person who's sahib dunya a person money he's thinking about i've got a building it's 100 floors i want to make it 200 and i have a tall building in this country i also want to make sure that i have this much property again i'm not saying all of that is haram by the way i'm not saying that but it will affect your heart the next day you wake up and say you know what my salary isn't good my salary and the money that i make isn't good enough man it affected you already it what it affected you and i'm sure that i'm not imposing my thoughts onto you all you all felt that way sir. someone you've met and they made you feel small in a good way or a bad way okay so the heart gets affected by who it associates with or who you associate yourself with the next one that the author Allah mentioned is the stomach having little food having little food having cutting down on your diet and what you eat cutting down on what you eat some people they eat with two hands and they eat a lot and when you say to them Akhi, where's the thuluth he goes I know my thuluth better than you say Akhi, one third he goes I know my one third better than you <laughs> Now everyone's one third is the same the, what you eat and what you take in it affects the way that you are ولذلك, I think Imam Qahtani said in his Nuniya he said he said he said he said stay away from eating too much and eating so much he said فَجُسُومُ أَهْلِ الْعِلْمِ غَيْرَ السِّمَانِ because the body of the people of knowledge is all oh, they're slim generally the people of slim what happens if you eat a lot نَامَتِ الْفِكْرَةِ وَكَفَّتِ الْأَعْضَاءَ عَنِ الْعِبَادَةِ your mind switches off and what happens to you 
you physically can't do anything. If you eat a lot at night, can you, you have a long sleep, right? You can't get up easily. Sahfa Fajr, you're struggling and whatnot. Qiyamul Layl, you're not going to get up for it. So don't eat too much. And even if you do eat, eat something healthy. And this does affect your heart, what you eat. Imam Shafi'i saw Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani. And Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani was what? Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani was a very big man. Are we all together? Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani is a student of Abu Hanifa. He's a student of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. Muhammad ibn Hassan al Shaybani was very big. And Imam Shafi'i said, rahimahullah, when he saw him, he said, La yuflihu samin al qat. A chubby person will never be successful in this religion after Muhammad al Hassan Shaybani. <laughs> Umar anhu saw a man who had a big stomach. And this man goes, Alhamdulillah, this is the blessing of Allah. He said, No, it's a punishment sent from Allah to you. Who said that? Umar radiallahu anhu. Ibn al Qayyim mentioned it in his Kitab Madaruj Salikin. Ibn al Qayyim mentioned that statement in his Kitab Madaruj Salikin. I recently came across it. A person should avoid eating too much. Eat enough for your back to stand. Enough. Just, just stand and do your work. But some people, whenever they get tired, oh, I just have to eat. Whenever they get stressed, they eat. And every time they eat, eat. I will stay away from that. The, um, how many did I mention? Four, right? I mentioned three, right? I mentioned four, naam. Last but not least, the fifth one is Humbling yourself at night. Even if it's not Qiyamul Layl, but Allah praised those people who beg their Lord at night. Allah said, At midnight. They are asking their Lord for forgiveness. In another ayah, Allah says, وَالْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ بِالْأَسْحَارِ Asking forgiveness to Allah in the night, in the middle of the night. Begging Allah. There was an athar that Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned, and Ibn Abi Dunya also mentioned. It's just a statement, it's a side benefit. That Nabiullah Dawood asked Jibreel. Nabiullah Dawood asked what? Jibreel. He said to him, when is the time when Allah is most forgiving for a person's sins? When is the best time to ask for forgiveness? And Jibreel said, I don't know. But one thing I do know, that in the last third of the night, Bil-Ashar, Allah's throne moves. Allah's throne, Allah's throne moves. So maybe it's wise to ask Allah for forgiveness at that time, he said. Another point that I want to mention after those five extra ones that I want to mention, two more, and I'll conclude with that, inshallah ta'ala, that is one of the things that soften the heart is giving rizq and helping the masakeen, the people in need. Helping the people in need softens the heart and it cures the illness of the heart. And also taking good care of the orphans. Al-Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he narrated in his Musnad on the authority of Abu Hurairah, anna rajulan shaka ila rasulillah. A man came to the Prophet and he complained. He complained from what? Qaswata qalbi. He said, my heart is darkened and it's a dull heart. I'm suffering from qaswatul qalb. A man saying this to the Prophet. Then the Prophet said to the man, in aratta ayyalina qalbak. إِنْ أَرَدْتَ أَنْ يَلِينَ قَلْبُكَ If you want your heart to be soft, and if your heart, if you want your heart softened, فَأَطْعِمِ الْمِسْكِينَ Give to the miskeen, the needy, the one in, the poor one, give to him. وَمْسَحْ بِرَأْسِ الْيَتِيمِ And run your hands, run your hands through the hair of the orphan. Meaning be gentle and soft to the orphan. Be gentle to the orphan. And some people are very cruel, cruel to the orphans. Whether it be an orphan they took from someone else, they are cruel to the child. Allah says in the Quran, 
Let the ones who are looking after the orphans fear Allah Taala. That remember, it could be possible that one day you don't have the chance to live to see your children grow and you pass away and your children become orphans. Your children become what? Your children become orphans. How would you want then your children to be dealt with? A man came to Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal and he asked him, he said, qalbi? How can my heart become soft? A man came to Imam Ahmad and he asked him the same question. And Imam Ahmad said to him, Udkhulilmakbarata, go to the graveyards. Wamsahra yatim and run your hands through the hair of the orphan. And this is, of course, a reflection of being kind and caring and good to the orphan. Go to the graveyards. The Prophet said in the hadith, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratil quburi. I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves. I used to say to you, don't go to the graves. Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyaratil quburi fazuruha. Go and visit the graves. Fa'innaha turaqqil qalba wa tudbi'ul ayna wa tudakkiru bil akhirah. Because it softens the hearts. It makes the eyes water and it reminds you of the hereafter. With that, there was a great Imam by the name of Rabi ibn Khutaym, Rahimahullah, Abu Yazid, uh, Abu Zayd, Rahimahullah. Rabi ibn Khutaym, by the way, is the man that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said to him. He said to him, He said, Law ra'aka Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ala ahabbak. If the Prophet of Allah was to see you, he would have loved you. Rabi ibn Khutaym, he's a tabi'i. He said, If the Prophet saw you, he would have loved you. How great this man was. Rabi ibn Khutaym, he would go to the grave and he would go to the grave of people he knew and he would call them out and when they don't respond he'll say ah oh, i wish i knew what you did and what is being done to you and then he cries he used to cry imam ahmed rahimahullah also mentioned another thing that also softens the heart and also makes a person's heart become soft and that is Aklul Halal. Eating Halal. Yahya al Jalla and Umar ibn Salih at Tartusi, they both came to Umar Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Who did they come to? Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And when they came to Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, they said to him, Imam, what can soften one's heart? And then Imam Ahmed said, Aklul Halal, eat Halal. Stay away from Haram. Money, haram, income, stay away from it. When they asked him that, they went to another imam whose name was Abdul Wahhab ibn al Warraq. And they went and they asked the same question to him. And then he said, Allah In the remembrance of Allah, the heart finds soft, the heart softened and the heart's heart trembles and finds tranquility. And then they said to him, but Abdul Wahab, we asked Ahmed ibn Hanbal the same question. And he said, the minute they said Ahmed ibn Hanbal, we asked him the question, Abdul Wahab ibn al Warraq, his face became red out of happiness to want to hear what Ahmed said. He said, Mada qal Ahmed? Mada qal? What did Ahmed ibn Hanbal say? Again, this was the respect that the scholars had for each other and the admiration and how they admired one another. And he said, Ahmed said, Aklul halal. He said, Ahmed said, eating halal. And then he said, Wallahi, he's right. Wallahi, he's right. Wallahi, he's right. So, ya ikhwa, all of those things that we mentioned today and many more things, they soften the heart and they make your heart become qalb which is salim, a pure heart. And once your qalb becomes salim, ya ikhwah, actions become easy for you. Enthusiasm, the energy that you come with, the commitment. Oh, I need to go home, I need to sleep. Oh, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. All of that will, will die. Well, the scholars, they used to say, scholars, they used to say, anyone, whose heart is alive and has high aspiration, may Allah have mercy on his body. Why? 
because the body will not be able to keep up with what this heart is producing. The energy, the fuel, the, 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 the power, the engine that's on this heart is so strong that the body gets tired, but the heart is not. It's still awake. It's what? It's still awake. And this is what it really is. Some people, they make excuses for themselves. Well, I haven't got enough sleep. And I never ate well today. Wallahi, these issues are happening in my life. That's what's making me like this. The truth is, you are a person whose heart is tainted. And if you don't admit to that first, you won't rectify the problem at hand. You won't. And that's where it comes from. The early scholars, if you read their biography, what you find from them is, whenever khair is mentioned, they stood up. And what did they say? Uh, now, okay, let's go. Like uh, Ibn Abi Hatim, rahimahullah. Look at Ibn Abi Hatim, the great scholar. He said, we traveled to seek knowledge. We walked distance that our urine turned into blood. Urine turned into what? Blood. How could that happen? Because of the heat that they're in. No air condition, of course. They're walking in the sun from one place to another. And one of the stories that was mentioned in their life was Abu Hatim al-Razi who said, it's a long story, I don't want to go into it now, but in the story it was mentioned that they had a halaqa, a dars, a lesson. And the shaykh didn't come for one reason or another. And so they went out because they haven't eaten for the whole entire day. So they went out to get themselves a fish to eat it. And so when they got themselves the fish, it took them a while to get the fish. They were informed that the teacher made it and that the teacher is here. They left the fish for another day for them to finish the halakha. Are we all together, brothers? These are the great imams and how they were like and how enthusiastic they were. All of this is because of they cleansed their hearts. They cleaned their hearts. Are we all together? They cleaned their hearts. Some of you might say today, I got a job. I, how, can I, how can I reconcile between my job and seeking Islamic knowledge and learning? Do you not know the same thing happened to Al-Imam Ahmed? Al-Imam Ahmed's father died when he was very young. And his mother only had him to, as a son to look after his family, his mother. And Ahmed saw it upon himself to what? to provide for his mother and also to seek Islamic knowledge, both. Go read the, how he can reconcile between it, how he did it. It's all about discipline and the heart of the person. And does this Islamic knowledge mean anything to you, Aslan? Does it really mean something to you? Are you really in love of this deen? Then if you are, you will find it in your heart, a way to squeeze it in. A way to what? To squeeze it in, inshallah ta'ala. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, a shaytan. And Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk.